Ja, ja, nu är det här. Jag sa så. Pias älgar. För ej sjukdom. Ogas. Och strad. Ej stej. Babelia. Jag sa så. Noga, noga, aja. Zero. Welcome to the 266th of the Cthulhu Podcasts. I'm Felbrick. Today we'll be starting off with part two of chapter one of Sir Ernest Shackleton's book, South, and then we'll follow up with the next part of the dark, horrifying future of mankind in The Nightland. So, let's go south. The conditions became harder on December the 14th. There was a misty haze and occasional falls of snow. A few bergs were in sight. The pack was denser than it had been on the previous days. Older ice was intermingled with the young ice, and our progress became slower. The propeller received several blows in the early morning, but no damage was done. A platform was rigged under the jib boom, in order that Hurley might secure some kinematograph pictures of the ship breaking through the ice. The young ice did not present difficulties to the endurance, which was able to smash a way through, but the lumps of older ice were more formidable obstacles, and conning the ship was a task requiring close attention. The most careful navigation could not prevent an occasional bump against ice too thick to be broken or pushed aside. The southerly breeze strengthened to a moderate southwesterly gale during the afternoon, and at 8pm we hove to, stem against a flow, it being impossible to proceed without serious risk of damage to the rudder or the propeller. I was interested to notice that, although we had been steaming through the pack for three days, the northwesterly swell still held with us. It added to the difficulties of navigation in the lanes, since the ice was constantly in movement. The endurance remained against the flow for the next twenty-four hours, when the gale moderated. The pack extended to the horizon in all directions, and was broken by innumerable narrow lanes. Many bergs were in sight, and they appeared to be travelling through the pack in a southwesterly direction under the current influence. Probably the pack itself was moving northeast with the gale. Clark put down a net in search of specimens, and at two fathoms it was carried southwest by the current and fouled the propeller. He lost the net, two leads, and a line. Ten bergs drove to the south through the pack during twenty-four hours. The noon position was sixty-one degrees thirty-one minutes south, longitude eighteen degrees twelve minutes west. The gale had moderated at eight p.m., and we made five miles to the south before midnight, and then we stopped at the end of a long lead, waiting till the weather cleared. It was during this short run that the captain, with semaphore hard a port, shouted to the scientist at the wheel, "'Why in paradise don't you port?' The answer came in indignant tones. "'I was blowing my nose!' The endurance made some progress on the following day. Long leads of open water ran towards the southwest, and the ship smashed at full speed through occasional areas of young ice, until brought up with a heavy thud against a section of older flow. Worsley was out on the jib-boom end for a few minutes while Wilde was conning the ship, and he came back with a glowing account of a novel sensation. The boom was swinging high and low and from side to side, while the massive bows of the ship smashed through the ice, splitting it across, piling it mass on mass, and then shouldering it aside. The air temperature was 37 degrees Fahrenheit pleasantly warm, and the water temperature 29 degrees Fahrenheit. We continued to advance through the fine long leads until 4 a.m. on December the 17th, when the ice became difficult again. Very large flows of six months old ice lay close together. Some of these flows presented a square mile of unbroken surface, and among them were patches of thin ice and several flows of heavy old ice. Many bergs were in sight, and the course became devious. The ship was blocked at one point by a wedge-shaped piece of flow, but we put the ice anchor through it, towed it astern, and proceeded through the gap. Steering under these conditions required muscle as well as nerve. There was a clatter aft during the afternoon, and Hussey, who was at the wheel, exclaimed that the wheel spun round and threw me over the top of it. The noon position was latitude 62 degrees 13 minutes south, longitude 18 degrees 53 minutes west and on the run for the preceding twenty-four hours had been thirty-two miles in a southwesterly direction. We saw three blue whales during the day, and one emperor penguin, 
a fifty-eight-pound bird which was added to the larder. The morning of December the 18th found the endurance proceeding amongst large floes with thin ice between them. The leads were few. There was a northerly breeze with occasional snow flurries. We secured three crab-eater seals, two cows and a bull. The bull was a fine specimen, nearly white all over and nine foot three inches long. He weighed six hundred pounds. Shortly before noon, further progress was barred by heavy pack, and we put an ice anchor onto the floe and banked the fires. I had been prepared for evil conditions in the Weddell Sea, but had hoped that in December and January, at any rate, the pack would be loose, even if no water was to be found. What we were actually encountering was fairly dense pack of a very obstinate character. Pack ice might be described as a gigantic and interminable jigsaw puzzle devised by nature. The parts of the puzzle in loose pack have floated slightly apart and become disarranged. At numerous places they have pressed together again, and as the pack gets closer and congested areas grow larger and parts are jammed harder until finally it becomes close pack, when the whole of the jigsaw puzzle becomes jammed to such an extent that with care and labour it can be traversed in every direction on foot. Where the parts do not fit closely there is of course open water, which freezes over in a few hours after giving off volumes of frost smoke. In obedience to renewed pressure this young ice rafts, so forming double thicknesses of a toffee-like consistency. Again the opposing edges of heavy flows rear up in slow and almost silent conflict, until these hedgerows are formed round each part of the puzzle. At the junction of several flows, chaotic areas of piled-up blocks and masses of ice are formed. Sometimes, five feet to six feet, piles of evenly shaped blocks of ice are seen so neatly laid that it seems impossible for them to be nature's work. Again, a winding canyon may be traversed between icy walls six to ten feet high, or a dome may be formed that under renewed pressure bursts upward like a volcano. All the winter the drifting pack changes, grows by freezing, thickens by rafting, and corrugates by pressure. If finally in its drift it impinges on a coast such as the western shore of the Weddell Sea, terrific pressure is set up and an inferno of ice blocks, ridges and hedgerows results, extending possibly for 150 to 200 miles offshore. Sections of pressure ice may drift away subsequently and become embedded in new ice. I have given this brief explanation here in order that the reader may understand the nature of the ice through which we pushed our way for many hundreds of miles. Another point may require to be explained was the delay caused by wind while we were in the pack. When a strong breeze or a moderate gale was blowing, the ship could not safely work through any except young ice, up to about two feet in thickness. As ice of that nature never extended for more than a mile or so, it followed that in a gale in the pack we had to lie to. The ship was three foot three inches down by the stern, and while this saved the propeller and a rudder a good deal, it made the endurance practically unmanageable in close pack when the wind attained a force of six miles an hour from ahead, since the air currents had such a big surface forward to act upon. The pressure of wind on bows and of the yards and the foremast would cause the bows to fall away, and in these conditions the ship could not be steered into the narrow lanes and leads through which we had to thread our way. The falling away of the bows, moreover, would tend to bring the stern against the ice, compelling us to stop the engines in order to save the propeller. Then the ship would become unmanageable and drift away, with the possibility of getting excessive sternway on her and so damaging rudder or propeller, the Achilles heel of a ship in pack ice. While we were waiting for the weather to moderate and the ice to open, I had the Lucas sounding machine rigged over the rudder trunk, I found the depth to be 2,800 fathoms. The bottom sample was lost owing to the line parting 60 fathoms from the end. During the afternoon, the Adele penguins approached the ship across the floe while Hussey was discoursing sweet music on the banjo. The solemn-looking little birds appeared to appreciate it's a long way to Tipperary, but they fled in horror when Hussey treated them to a little of the music that comes from Scotland. The shouts of laughter from the ship added to their dismay, and they made off as fast as their short legs would carry them. The pack opened slightly at 6.15pm, and we proceeded through lanes for three hours before being forced to anchor to a flow for the night. We fired a Hewitt Mark harpoon, number 171, 
into a blue whale on this day. The conditions did not improve during December the 19th. A fresh, too strong northerly breeze brought haze and snow, and after proceeding for two hours the endurance was stopped again by heavy flows. It was impossible to manoeuvre the ship in the ice owing to the strong wind which kept the flows in movement and caused lanes to open and close with dangerous rapidity. The noon observation showed that we'd made six miles to the southeast in the previous twenty-four hours. All hands were engaged during the day in rubbing shoots off of our potatoes, which were found to be sprouting freely. We remained moored to a flow over the following day. The wind not having moderated, indeed it freshened to a gale in the afternoon, and the members of the staff and crew took advantage of the pause to enjoy a vigorous contested game of football on the level surface of the flow alongside the ship. Twelve bergs were in sight at this time. The noon position was latitude 62 degrees 42 minutes south, longitude 17 degrees 54 minutes west, showing that we had drifted about six miles in a north-easterly direction. Monday the 21st of December was beautifully fine, with a gentle west-northwesterly breeze. We made a start at 3 a.m. and proceeded through the pack in a southwesterly direction. At noon we had gained seven miles almost due east and northerly drift of the pack, having continued while the ship was apparently moving to the south. Petrels of several species, penguins and seals, were plentiful, and we saw four small blue whales. At noon we entered a long lead to the southward and passed around and between nine splendid bergs. One mighty specimen was shaped like the Rock of Gibraltar, but with steeper cliffs, and another had a natural dock that would have contained the Aquintiana. A spur of ice closed the entrance to the huge blue pool. Hurley brought out his kinematograph camera in order to make a record of these bergs. Fine long leads running east and southeast amongst the bergs were found during the afternoon. But at midnight the ship was stopped by a small heavy ice flow, tightly packed against an unbroken plane of ice. The outlook from the masthead was not encouraging. The big flow was at least fifteen miles long and ten miles wide. The edge could not be seen at the widest part, and the area of the flow must have been not less than 150 square miles. It appeared to be formed of old ice, not very thick and with few hummocks or ridges in it. We thought it must have been formed at sea in very calm weather and drifted up from the southeast. I have never seen such a large area of unbroken ice in the Ross Sea. We waited with banked fires for the strong easterly breeze to moderate or to open the pack. At 6.30pm on December 22nd, some lanes opened and we were able to move towards the south again. The following morning found us working slowly through the pack, and the noon observation gave us a gain of 19 miles south, 41 degrees west, for the 17 and a half hours we'd been under steam. Many year old Adelis, three crab eaters, six sea leopards, one weddell and two blue whales were seen. The air temperature, which had been down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit on December 21st, had risen to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and while we were working along the leads to the southward in the afternoon, we counted 15 bergs. Three of these were table-topped, and one was about 70 feet high and five miles long. Evidently, it had come from a barrier edge. The ice became heavier and slightly more open, and we had a calm night and fine long leads of open water. The water was so still that new ice was forming on the leads. We had a run of 70 miles to our credit at noon on December the 24th, the position being latitude 64 degrees 32 minutes south, longitude 17 degrees 17 minutes west. All the dogs except eight had been named. I do not know who had been responsible for some of the names which seemed to represent a variety of tastes. They were as follows. Upton Bristol, Mill Hill, Songster, Sandy, Mac, Mercury, Wolf, Abmundson, Hercules, Hackenschmidt, Samson, Sammy, Skipper, Caruso, Sub, Ulysses, Spotty, Boson, Slobbers, Sadie, Sue, Sally, Jasper, Tim, Sweep, Martin, Split Lip, Luke, Saint, Satan, Chips, Stumps, Snapper, Painful, Bob, Snowball, Jerry, Judge, Sooty, Rufus, Sidelights, Simeon, Swanker, Chergwin, 
Steamer, Peter, Fluffy, Steward, Slippery, Elliot, Roy, Noel, Shakespeare, Jamie, Bummer, Smuts, Lupoid, Spider, and Sailor. Some of the names, it will be noticed, had a descriptive flavour. Heavy flows held up the ship from midnight until 6am on December the 25th, Christmas Day. Then they opened a little and we made progress until 11.30am when the leads closed again. We'd encountered good leads and workable ice during the early part of the night, and the noon observation showed that our run for 24 hours was the best since we entered the pack a fortnight earlier. We'd made 71 miles south and 4 degrees west. The ice held us up until the evening, and then we were able to follow some leads for a couple of hours before the tightly packed flows and the increasing wind compelled a stop. The celebration of Christmas was not forgotten. Grog was served at midnight to all on deck. There was grog again at breakfast for the benefit of those who had been in their bunks at midnight. Lees had decorated the wardroom with flags and a little Christmas present for each of us. Some of us had presents from home to open, and later there was a really splendid dinner consisting of turtle soup, white bait, jugged hare, Christmas pudding, mince pies, dates, figs, and crystallised fruits, with rum and stout as drinks. In the evening, everybody joined in a sing-song. Hussey had made a one-stringed violin on which, in the words of Worsley, he discoursed quite painlessly. The wind was increasing to a moderate south-easterly gale, and no advance could be made, so we were able to settle down to the enjoyments of the evening. The weather was still bad on December the 26th and 27th, and the endurance remained anchored to a flow. The noon position on the 26th was latitude 65 degrees 43 minutes south, longitude 17 degrees 36 minutes west. We made another sounding on this day with the Lucas machine and found the bottom at 2,800 fathoms. The specimen brought up was a pterogenous blue mud glacial deposit with some radiolaria. Everyone took turns at the work of heaving in, two men working together in ten-minute spells. Sunday, December the 27th, was a quiet day aboard. The southwesterly gale was blowing the snowing clouds off the floe, and the temperature had fallen to 23 degrees Fahrenheit. The dogs were having an uncomfortable time in their deck quarters. The wind was moderated by the following morning, but it was squally with snow flurries, and I did not order a start until 11pm. The pack was still close, but the ice was softer and more easily broken. During the pause the carpenter had rigged a small stage over the stern. A man was stationed there to watch the propeller and to prevent it striking heavy ice, and the arrangement proved very valuable. It saved the rudder as well as the propeller from many blows. The high winds that had prevailed for four and a half days gave way to a gentle southerly breeze in the evening of December the 29th. Owing to the drift, we were actually 11 miles further north than we'd been on December the 25th, but we made a fairly good progress on the 30th in fine, clear weather. The ship followed a long lead to the southeast during the afternoon and the evening, and at 11 p.m., we crossed the Antarctic Circle. An examination of the horizon disclosed considerable breaks in the vast circle of pack ice, interspersed with bergs of different sizes. Leads could be traced in the various directions, but I looked in vain for an indication of open water. The sun did not set that night, and as it was concealed behind a bank of clouds, we had a glow of crimson and cloud to the southward, with delicate pale green reflections in the water of the lanes to the southeast. The ship had a serious encounter with the ice on the morning of December the 31st. We were stopped first by flows closing around us, and then about noon the endurance got jammed between two flows heading east-northeast. The pressure healed the ship over six degrees while we were getting an ice anchor onto the flow in order to heave astern and thus assist the engines, which were running at full speed. The effort was successful. Immediately afterwards, at the spot where the endurance had been held, Slabs of ice fifty feet by fifteen feet and four feet thick were forced ten or twelve feet up on the lee flow at an angle of forty-five degrees. The pressure was severe, and we were not sorry to have the ship out of its reach. The noon position was latitude sixty-six degrees forty-seven minutes south, longitude fifteen degrees fifty-two minutes west, and the run for the preceding twenty-four hours 
was a total of 51 miles south and 29 degrees east. Since noon the character of the pack has improved, wrote Worsley on this day. Though the leads are short, the flows are rotten and easily broken through if a good place is selected with care and judgment. In many cases we find large sheets of young ice through which the ship cuts for a mile or two at a stretch. I've been conning and working the ship from the crow's nest and find it much the best place, as from there one can see ahead and work out the course beforehand, and also guard the rudder and the propeller, the most vulnerable parts of a ship in the ice. At midnight I was sitting in the tub, I heard a clamorous noise down on the deck, with ringing of bells, and realised that it was the new year. Worsley came down from his lofty seat, and met Wilde, Hudson and myself on the bridge, where we shook hands and wished one another a happy and a successful new year. Since entering the pack on December the 11th, we'd come 480 miles, through loose and close-packed ice. We'd pushed and fought the little ship through, and she had stood well, the test, though the propeller had received some shrewd blows against the hard ice, and the vessel had been driven against the floe until she had been fairly mounted up onto it, and slid back rolling heavily from side to side. The rolling had been frequently caused by the operation of cracking through thickish young ice, where the crack had taken a sinuous course. The ship, in attempting to follow it, struck first one bilge and then the other, causing her to roll six or seven degrees. Our advance through the pack had been in a south ten degrees east direction, and I estimated that the total steaming distance had exceeded seven hundred miles. The first hundred miles had been through loose pack, but the greatest hindrances had been three moderate southwesterly gales, two lasting for three days each and one for four and a half days. The last 250 miles had been through close pack alternating with fine long leads and stretches of open water. During the weeks we spent manoeuvring to the south through the tortuous mazes of the pack, it was necessary often to split flows by driving the ship against them. This form of attack was effective against ice up to three feet in thickness, and the process is interesting enough to be worth describing briefly. When the way was barred by a flow of moderate thickness, we would drive the ship at half speed against it, stopping the engines just before impact. At the first blow the endurance would cut a V-shaped nick in the face of the flow, the slope of her cut water often causing her bows to rise until nearly clear of the water, when she would slide backwards, rolling slightly. Watching carefully that loose lumps of ice did not damage the propeller, we would reverse the engines and back the ship off two or three hundred yards. She would then be driven full speed into the V, taking care to hit the centre accurately. The operation would be repeated until a short dock was cut into which the ship, acting as a large wedge, was driven. At about the fourth attempt, if it was to succeed at all, the flow would yield. A black, sinuous line, as though pen drawn on white paper, would appear ahead, broadening as the eye traced it back to the ship. Presently it would be broad enough to receive her, and we would forge ahead. Under the bows and alongside, great slabs of ice were being turned over and slid back onto the flow, or driven down and underneath the ice or the ship. In thus way, the endurance would split a two- or three-foot flow a square mile in extent. Occasionally the flow, although cracked across, would be so held by other flows that it would refuse to open wide, and so gradually would bring the ship to a standstill. We would then go astern for some distance and again drive her full speed into the crack, until finally the flow would yield to the repeated onslaughts. And now it's time to return to the horrors of the nightland, with part one of chapter four. Chapter four. The Hushing of the Voice Dearest, thine own feet tread the world at night, treading as moonflakes step across a dark, kissing the very dew to holier light. Thine voice, a song past mountains which to hark, frightens my soul with an utter lost delight. Now, one night, towards the end of the sixteenth hour, as I made ready to sleep, there came all about me the thrilling of the ether, as often happened in those days. But the thrilling had a strange power in it, and in my soul the voice of Nani sounded plain, all within and about me. 
Yet, though I knew it to be the voice of Nani, I answered not immediately, save to send the sure question of the master word into the night. And directly I heard the answer, the master word beating steadily in the night. And I questioned Nani why she had speech with me by the instrument at that time, when all were sleeping, and the watch set amongst the monstrowakans, for they in the little pyramid had their sleep time to commence at the eleventh hour, so that by this it was five hours advanced towards the time of waking. And Nani, she should have slept, nor have been abroad to the Tower of Observation apart from her father, for I suppose that she spoke by the instrument, her voice sounding very clear in my brain. Yet to this question she made no answer in kind, but gave a certain thing into my spirit which set me trembling, for she said certain words that began, Dearest thine own feet tread the world at night. And it well may be that she set me to tremble, for as the words grew about me there wakened a memory dream how that I had made these same words to Murdath the beautiful in the long-ago eternity of this our age, when she had died and left me alone in all the world. And I was weak a little, with the tumult and the force of my emotion. But in a moment I called eagerly with my brain elements to Nani, to give some explaining of this thing that she had spoken to the utter troubling of my heart. Yet once more she made no direct answer, but spoke the words again to me across all the dark of the world. And it came to me suddenly that it was not Nani that spoke, but Murdoch, the beautiful, from out of all the everlasting night. And I called, Murdath? Murdath, with my brain elements into the night. And lo, the far faint voice spoke again to my spirit through all the darkness of eternity, saying again those words. Yet though the voice was the voice of Murdath the beautiful, it was also the voice of Nani. And I knew in all my heart that this thing was in verity and that it had been given to me to be birthed once more into this world in the living time of that only one, with whom my spirit and essence hath mated in all the ages through the everlasting. But I called with my brain elements, and all my strength to Nani, and there came no answer, neither sign of hearing through all the long hours I called. And thus at last I came to an utter exhaustion, but neither could be quiet nor sleep yet Presently I did sleep. And when I waked, my first memory was of the wondrous thing which had befallen in the sleep time, for none in all this world could have known those words, save it had been the spirit of Murdath, my beautiful one, looking from above my shoulder in that utter lost time, as I made those words to her, out of an aching and broken heart. And the voice had been the voice of Murdath, and the voice of Murdath had been the voice of Nani. And what shall any say to this, save that which I had in my heart? And immediately I called to Nani once, and again twice, and in a little moment there came all about me the throbbing of the master word, beating solemnly in the night. And I sent the master word to give assurance, and immediately the voice of Nani, a little weak as it was always when she had not the instrument, but sent the message with her brain elements. And I answered her, and questioned her eagerly concerning her sayings of the past time of sleep. But she disclaimed, and made clear to me that she had no knowledge of having spoken, but had slept through all that time of which I had made to tell, and indeed had dreamed a very strange dream. And for a little while I was confused, and meditated, not knowing what to think, but came suddenly again to a knowledge that Nani's far voice was thrilling the ether all about, and that she would tell to me her dream, which had set strong upon her mind. And she told the dream to me, and in the dream she had seen a tall dark man, built very big, and dressed in unfamiliar clothing, and the man had been in a little room and very sorrowful and lonesome, and in her dream she had gone nigh to him, and presently the man made to write, that he might ease him by giving expression to his sorrow. And Nani had been able to read the words that he wrote, though to her waking spirit the language in which they were writ was strange and unknown. Yet she could not remember what he had writ save but one short line, and this she had mind of in that he had writ the word Murdath above. And she spoke of the strangeness of this thing, 
and that she should dream of this name, but supposed that I had fixed it upon her by my first callings. And then did I, with something of a tremble in my spirit, ask Nani to tell me what she remembered of the writing of that big, sorrowful stranger. And in a little moment, her far voice said these words all about me. Dearest, thine own feet tread the world at night. But no more had she memory of it. Yet it was a sufficiency, and I, maybe with a mad strange triumph in my soul, said unto her with my brain elements that which remained of those words, and in my spirit felt them strike upon the spirit of Nani, and awake her memory as with the violence of a blow. And for a little while she stumbled, dumb before much newness and certainty, and her spirit then to awaken, and she near wept with the fright and the sudden, the new wonder of this thing. And immediately all about me there came her voice thrilling, and the voice was the voice of Murdath, and the voice of Nani. And I heard the tears of her spirit make pure and wonderful the bewildered and growing gladness of her far voice. And she asked me, as one who had suddenly opened the gates of memory, whether she might be truly Murdath. And I, utter weak and shaken strangely because of this splendour of fulfilment, could make no instant answer. And she asked again, but using mine old love name, and with a sureness in her far voice, and still I was so strangely dumb, and the blood to thud peculiar in mine ears, and this to pass, and speech to come swift. And this way to be that thou meeting of spirits across all the everlasting nights. And you shall have for a memory picture how that Nani stood there in the world in that far eternity, and with her spirit having speech with mine, looked back through that part-opened gates of her memory into the past of this, our life and age. Yet more than this she saw, and more than was given to me in that age. For she had memory now, and sight of other instances, and of other comings together, which had some confusion and but half meanings to me. Yet of this, our present age and life, we spoke as of some yesterday, but very hallowed. Now, as may be conceived, the wonder of this surety which had come into my life stirred me fiercely to its completion, for all my heart and spirit cried out to be with that one who was Murdath, and now spoke with the voice of Nani. Yet how should this be won? For none among all the learned men of that mighty pyramid knew the position of the lesser redoubt. Neither could the records and histories of the world give us that knowledge, only that there was a general thought amongst the students and the monstrowakans that it lay between the northwest and the northeast. But no man had any surety, neither could any conceive of the distance from us of that refuge. And counting all this, there was yet the incredible danger and peril of the nightland, and the hunger and the desolation of the outer lands which were sometimes named the unknown lands. And I spoke much with Nani concerning this matter of their position, yet neither she nor her father, the master Monstrowakan of that refuge, had any knowing either of our position, only that the builder of the lesser redoubt had come out of the southward world in the beginning, as they had knowledge of by any of the records. Also, the father of Nani set that ancient compass to bear, for as he made explanation to us through the instrument, so great a power of the earth current must be ours, that perchance it was our force which did affect the pointer from steadfastness. For indeed the needle did swing in an arc, as we heard, that held between the north and the south, and within the westward arc. But this it had done ever with them, and so was a very helpless guide, save that, maybe, as we had thought, the force of the earth current that was with us had in truth some power to pull the needle towards us. And if this were so of verity, we made a reckoning that set the lesser redoubt to the north, and they did likewise, and put us to the south. Yet it was all built upon the sand of guesswork, and nothing to adventure the life and soul upon. Now we, of curiosity, though a million times had it been done in the past ages, set the compass before us, having it from the great museum. But as ever in that age it did spin if we but stirred the needle, and would stop nowheres with surety for the flow of the earth current from the crack beneath the pyramid had a power to affect it away from the north, and to set it wandering about. And this may seem very strange to this present age, yet to that 
it was most true to the seeming nature of things, and harder to believe that ever it did once point steadfastly to prove a guide of sureness and unfailing. For, be it known, we knew the positions of the land by tradition, coming from that ancient time when in the half-gloom they had builded the pyramid, they having known the use of that ancient compass, and with the sight of the sun had named the positions, though we of that far future day had forgotten the very beginnings of those names of direction, and used them because our fathers did a million years or more. And, likewise, we did the same with the names of the day and the night, and the weeks and the months and the years, though of the visible markings of these there was nothing but only and always the everlasting night, yet the same seeming very natural to that people. Now Nani, having heed to my constant questions, craved with an utter keen hunger that I might come to her, but yet forbade it, in that it were better to live and commune in the spirit than to risk my soul and mayhaps die in the foolishness of trying to find her in all the darkness of the dead world. Yet, no heed had I taken of her commands, but I had but known of a surety the direction in which she might be discovered, and gained some knowledge of the space between, for this might be named by thousands of miles, or but by hundreds, though a great distance it was surely. Yet one other thing there was that has point in this place, for when I sent my speech out into the night using my brain elements, I came to know that whether I had knowledge of the north or no knowledge at the moment, yet did I turn oft with the same instinction to that direction. And of this the master monster Wakan took very great note, and had me to experiment many a time and way, and so enclosed about with screens or with bandages across mine eyes, that I could not, save by that inward knowing, have any knowledge to point me the way. Yet would I turn northwards very frequent, and by a certain feeling and seemed unable of speech if I were turned otherwise by force. But when we asked Nani whether she had an unusualness in this matter, she could discover none, and we could but take note curiously of that which affected my habits, and which truly I set to the attracting of her spirit, for I had mind that she did be somewheres out that way in the darkness of the world. But yet was this no more than to suppose, as you may perceive. And the master Monstrowakan wrote a study of this matter of the northwardness of my turning, and it was set out in the hour slips of the Tower of Observation, so it came to be copied by the hour slips of the great cities, and made much comment, and much calling up to me through the home instruments, so that with this, and the speech that went about concerning my powers to hear, I was much in talk and diversely pleased and oft angered by overmuch attention and importunity. And now, whilst I ponder this matter in all my spirit and being, how that I should have some way to come to Nani, there befell a very terrible thing, and in this wise must I tell it. It was at the seventeenth hour, when all the millions of the mighty pyramid slept, that I was with the monster Monstrowakan in the Tower of Observation taking my due turn. And suddenly I heard the thrilling of the ether all about me, and the voice of Nani in my soul speaking, and I sent the master word into the darkness of the world, and presently I heard the solemn answer beating steadfastly in the night, and immediately I called to Nani with my brain elements to know what thing troubled her in her sleep. And her voice came into my spirit, weak and far and faint, and so that scarce that I could not hear her words. Yet in a while I gathered that all the peoples of the lesser redoubt were in very deeply trouble, for that earth current had failed suddenly and mightily, and they had called her from her sleep that she might listen whether we answered their callings by the instrument. But indeed no calling had come to us. And they, who had been of late so joyful, were now grown old with sorrow in but an hour or two, for they feared that the fresh coming of the earth current had been but the final flicker and outburst before the end. And even in this short while of our speech did it seem to me that the voice of Nani grew further off from me, and I felt like to have broken my heart with the trouble of this thing. And through all that remained of that sleep time did I converse with Nani, as might two lovers who shall presently part for ever. And when the cities awoke, the news went throughout them, and all our millions were in sorrow and trouble. And thus it was for maybe a little month, 
and in that time had the voice of Nani grown so weak and far off that even that I had night hearing could scarce make real of its meaning. And every word was to me a treasure and a touch upon my soul. And my grief and trouble before this certain parting drove me that I could not eat, neither have rest, and this did the master monster Wakan take upon him to chide and correct. For that, if any were to help, how should it be done if that I had night hearing and heard now that the recording instruments were dumb, came to ill health? And because of this, and such wisdom as was mine, I made to eat and order my life that I might have my full powers. Yet was this beyond all my strength. For presently I knew that the people of the lesser pyramid were threatened by the monsters that beset them. And later I had knowledge from faint far words whispered in my brain that there had been a fight with an outside force that had harmed many in their minds. So that in their madness they had opened the gate and had run from the lesser pyramid out into the darkness of the lands about them. And there their physical bodies had fallen to the monsters of those lands. But of their souls who may know? And this we set assuredly to the failure of the earth current, which had robbed them of all force and power, so that in those few weeks all life and joy of living had left them, and neither hunger nor thirst had they much, nor any great desire to live, but yet a new and mighty fear of death, and this doth seem very strange. And as may be thought, all this made the peoples of the great redoubt think newly of the earth current that issued from the crack beneath the pyramid, and of their latter end, and so that much was writ in the hour slips concerning this matter yet in the main to assure us that we ourselves might be free from a disturbed heart, though some went foolishly to the other event, and spoke of a speedy danger to us likewise, as is ever the way. But the truth of our own case lay maybe somewhere between. And all the hour slips were full also of imaginings of the terror of those poor humans out in the darkness of the world, facing that end which must come upon all, even upon our mighty pyramid, though as most would believe, so far away in the future eternity, that we have no cause to trouble. And there were sad poems writ to the peoples of that lesser redoubt, and foolish plans set about to rescue them, but none to put into effect, and by no way by which so great a thing might be done, and doth but show how loosely people will speak out of over-security. Yet to me there had come a certain knowledge that I must make the adventure though I achieved naught save my own end. Yet it were better to cease quickly than that I should feel as I did feel now. That same night, in the eleventh hour, there was a great disturbance in the ether about the mighty pyramid, and I was awaked suddenly by the master monstrowacan, that I might use my gift of the night hearing to hearken for the throbbing of the master word, which they had thought to come vaguely through their instruments. But no one of the monstrowacans was sensitive enough of soul to account truly whether this was so. And lo, as I sat up in the bed, there came the sound of the master word, beating in the night about the pyramid, and immediately there was a crying in all the ether about me, We are coming! We are coming! And mine inwards leapt, and sickened me a moment, so shaken was I with a sudden belief, for the message seemed some ways to come to me from very near the great redoubt and that they who sent it were nigh to hand. And forthwith I called the master word into the night, but no answer did there come for a while, and then a faint thrilling of the ether about me, and the weak pulse of the master word in the night, sent by a far voice, strangely distant. And I knew that the voice was the voice of Nani, and I put a question through all the darkness of the dead world, whether she were within the lesser redoubt and safe thus far. And presently, there came a faint disturbance about me, and a small voice in my soul speaking weakly and out of an indefinite distance, and I knew that far away through the night Nani spoke feebly with her brain elements, and that she abode within the lesser pyramid, but that she too had heard that strange pulse of the master word in the night, and that message, we are coming, we are coming. And vastly had this thing disturbed her, waking her within her sleep, so that she knew not what to think, save that we were devising some method to come to them. But this I removed from doubt, saying that she must not build on vain hoping, 
for I would not have her doubly tortured by the vanity of such believing. And thereafter, having said such things as I might, though few they were, to comfort her, I bade her gently to sleep, and turned to therewith to the master Montrawakan, who waited in quiet patience, and had no knowledge of that which I had heard and sent, for his hearing was but the normal, and his brain and heart were such as made me to love him. And I told the master Monstrowaka many things as I put my clothing about me, how that there had indeed been the calling of the master word, but not by any of that lesser redoubt, but that, to my belief, it had come from nigh about the great pyramid. Moreover, it was sent by no instrument, as I wotted that he did guess, but as it seemed to me, by the brain elements of many calling in unison. And all this did I set out to the master Montrawakan, and with something uncertain of fear and trouble in my heart, yet with a blind expectation, as indeed who would not, though no longer was I shaken by that first thought of her nearness. And I said to the master Monstrowakan that we should go to the Tower of Observation, and search the night lands with the great spyglass. And we did this, and lo, presently we saw a great number of men pass over the electric circle that went about the pyramid, yet they came not to us but went outwards towards the blackness and the strange fires and hideous mysteries of the nightland. And we ceased from spying, and looked swiftly at one another, and knew in our hearts that some had left the mighty pyramid in the sleep time. Then the master Monstrowakan sent word to the master watchman that his wardship had been outraged, and that people left the great pyramid in the sleep time, for this was against the law, and none ever went out into the nightland save the full watch were posted to the great door and at a due time when all were wakeful, for the opening of the great door was made known to all the millions of the great redoubt, so that all might be aware and know that no foolishness was done without their wotting. Moreover, ere had any power to leave the pyramid, they must pass the examination, and be prepared. And some of this have I set out already, and so stern was the framing of the law that there were yet the mental pegs upon the inner side of the great gate, where had been stretched the skin of one who had disobeyed, and was flayed, and his hide set there to be a warning in the early days. Yet the tradition was remembered, for, as I might say, we lived very close about the place, and memory had no room whereby she might escape. Now the master watchman, when he heard that which the master Monstrowakan had to tell, went hastily with some of the central watch from the watchdome to the great gate, and he found the men of the sleep-time watch with the warder of the gate all bound, and stopped in the mouth, so that none could make outcry. And he freed them, and learned that nigh five hundred young men from their upper cities, by the bigness of their chests, had come upon them suddenly, and bound them, and escaped into the night through their eye-gate in the top of the great gate. And the master watchman was angry, and demanded why that none had called by the instruments of the watch-house. But lo, some had made to call thus, and found them unable to wake the recorders which lay in the central watch-dome, for there had been tampering. Now after this, they made certain new rules and laws concerning the order of watching, and made tests of the lesser instruments of the inward pyramid nightly upon the coming of the sleep-time, which was even in that strange age by tradition called the night, as I've given a hint here too. And furthermore, until the way of my story was known, I had used a word for the sleep hours that was yet not of that time, but somewhat an invention to make this history free from the confusion of night and day, when in truth it was always night without upon the world. Yet after this shall I keep to mine use the luxury of the true names of that time, and yet how strange it is that the truth should be of so little to our thinking. And so to go forward with my telling. For though all this care were now taken, it had no force until afterward, and at this moment were those poor foolish youths out in the danger of the nightland, and no way by which they might be succoured or called back, save that fear or wisdom should come to them quickly, that they cease from so wild an attempt. For it was to make rescue of those in that other unknown pyramid out in all the darkness of the world's night that was their intent, as we speedily had knowledge from those boon friends that had been in secret of their plot, which had seemed to them great and heroic, and so was in verity, but that neither they who went nor they who stayed had a true awareness of the danger they had dealing with, 
being all naught but raw and crude youths, yet doubtless with the makings of many fine and great men amongst them. And because some had thus abetted that which they knew to be against the law which was framed to the well-being and safety of all, there were certain floggings which might have the better help the memories in the future as to the properness of their actions and wisdom. Moreover, they who returned, if any, would be flogged as seemed proper after due examination. And though the news of their beatings might help all others to hesitation ere they did foolishly in like fashion, yet was the principle of the flogging not on this base, which would be both improper and unjust, but only that the one in question be corrected to the best advantage of his own well-being. For it is not meet that any principle of correction should shape to the making of human signposts of pain for the benefit of others. For in verity, this were to make one pay the cost of many's learning, and each should owe to pay only what as much shall suffice for his teaching of his own body and spirit. And if others profit thereby, this is but accident, however helpful. And this is wisdom, and denoteth how that a sound principle shall prevent practice from becoming monstrous. Yet now I must hasten that I set down how it fared with those five hundred youths that made so sad an adventure of their lives and unprepared souls. And they were beyond our aid to help them, who might not so much as make any calling to them, to bid them to return. For to do this would have been to tell all the monsters of the land that humans were abroad from the mighty pyramid and this would have been to cause the monsters to search the youths out to their destruction, and maybe even to awaken the forces to work them some dreadful spiritual harm, which was the chief fear. Now presently, through all the cities of the Great Redoubt, the news had gone that five hundred foolish youths had adventured out into the despair of the nightland, and the whole pyramid waked to life, and the peoples of the south came to the northern sides, for the Great Gate lay in the northwest side, and the youths had made from there not straightly outwards, but towards the north, and so were to be seen from the north-east embrasures, and from those within the north-west wall. And thus, in a while, they watched by all the mighty multitudes of the great pyramid, through millions of spy-glasses, for each human had a spying glass, as may be thought, and some were a hundred years old, and some maybe ten thousand, and handed down through many generations, and some but newly made, and very strange, but all those people had some instrument by which they might spy out upon the wonder of the nightland, for so had it been ever throughout the eternity of darkness, and a great diversion and wonder of life it was to behold the monsters about their work, and to know that they plotted always to our destruction, yet were ever foiled. And never did all that great and terrible land grow stale upon the soul of any, from birth until death, and by this you shall know the constant wonder of it, and that sense of enemies in the night about us, which ever filled the heart and spirit of all the beholders, so that never were the embrasures utterly empty. Yet many beheld not the land from the embrasures, but sat about the view-tables which were set properly in certain places throughout the cities, and so beheld the night-land without undue cranings or poising of spy-glasses, though less plain-seen. And these same tables were some form of that which we of this age name camera obscura, but made very great and with inventions, and low to the floor, so that ten thousand people might sit about them in the raised galleries and have a comfortable sight. Yet this attracted not the young people, save they were lovers, and then in truth they were comfortable seats for quietness and gentle whisperings. And that's all for today, except to remind you of my Patreon account, where you can support my production of audiobooks. As a patron, you'll get access not just to the stories published here in the podcast, but also to all the other books I record. At the moment, I'm recording The Heart of Darkness, Recollections of Rifleman Harris, a memoir from the Napoleonic Wars, and a sci-fi book called Masters of Space. Please go to patreon.com and search for Felbrig, F-E-L-B-R-I-G-G. This file is released on an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time. CthulhuPodcast.co.uk